up to now we've been concerned with constructing the configuration space of a collection of n identical particles in three, three plus one dimensions or higher. And we've constructed to this point a Hilbert space to represent all the possible kinematical configurations of a collection of an undetermined number of these particles. This space, we called it, we've introduced, we called it Fox space. And the notation we use for it, I think was gamma S of H, yeah, right. And gamma S of H, it takes as input a single particle configuration space, a single particle Hilbert space, and produces the configuration space for an arbitrary number of identical particles with this single particle configuration space H. This has been the center of our attention for the past couple of lectures. Now that's only the way to represent the kinematics for a system, just what state the system is in. What we really want, however, is a way to understand observations on the system, or equivalently evolutions as well. And that requires us to look at the operators on this Hilbert space here. So that's the task that we began in the previous lecture and what we're going to continue today. Until we understand the op operators on this space, we have no hope of attaching an equation to an observation we have no hope of describing how the system changes as time passes. So that's our task, to describe, understand operators on the space. And what makes this task very difficult is that there, that infinity symbol. I mean, even presuming that H is finite dimensional, the single particle space is finite dimensional, there is still an infinity lurking around. It's that one here. We have an indeterminate number, indeterminate number of particles. Therefore, we have to allow a possibly infinite number of particles. And now we've got to understand operators on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, which is not trivial. And to that end, we have to cope with the problem of writing down operators on infinite dimensional configuration spaces. So in finite dimensions, we don't have this issue. Or at least, it's not so abrupt, the problem. In finite dimensions, we can specify states and operators just with lists of numbers. So states are vectors or rays in Hilbert space. It's just a list of D complex numbers, say. And operators, operators, what are they? Well, they're just matrices in this case. So they're, they're D by D lists of complex numbers. And that's easy to put on a computer. You can just or even write on a piece of paper. You can just write down the entries of every entry of the vector, every entry of the matrix. It takes you some time to write it all out, approximately the amount of time, 
proportional to the number of entries in the matrix. It takes you a little bit more time to multiply these guys, approximately the cube of the side of the matrix, and so on. It takes you some time to do these manipulations, but they can all be done and everything can be fully specified. But in infinite dimensions, we don't have this luxury anymore. Even to specify a single state of a infinite dimensional Hilbert space, in principle, might require you to write down a list of an infinite number of numbers. And to specify an operator is much, much worse, right? And it feels a bit hopeless if you write it that way. But of course, what we do in practice is very interesting. In practice, when you do a calculation with a harmonic oscillator, or you do a calculation with a square well, or a calculation with anything that gets you numbers at the end, what you do is you only refer to a fixed basis for a start. You only consider states which are a linear combination of at most a finite number of these basis elements. And you only perform transformations which take you from a finite number of basis elements to a finite number of basis elements. So you effectively work in a finite dimensional universe. That's one way you do manipulations in infinite dimensional spaces. And the word basis was used there. You, you, you essentially commit to a, a basis. And then you, can, then you can work. Now that works very well on the vector space, on vectors. You just use the Hermite polynomials, for example, and you express everything in terms of the Hermite polynomials, or the sines and cosines, or, or whatever basis that it is appropriate for the question at hand. But operators are a different kettle of fish, potentially, right? We want to specify operators, and how many numbers does that need? Well, it needs a lot, because an operator represents every possible transformation that could happen in principle between any two elements. So it looks bad. It looks like you need an infinite number of numbers to specify just even the most simple operator. And the, the way we, we avoid this problem is we do exactly what we did for the vectors. We're going to choose a basis of operators, which we understand very, very well, and express everything in terms of this basis of operators. We commit to a basis. Now, you, you know, you're taught that preferred bases are bad and evil and wrong, but sometimes they just help. So that's what we're going to do for today. We're going to introduce a basis of operators, and we're going to do all our computations with respect to this basis, and we will only henceforth consider expressions which are finite linear combinations of these operators. That's the way we're going to avoid this infinity in this course. And these operators are, I wrote them down already, sort of familiar objects, I think, already from your first quantum mechanics course. They're the annihilation and creation operators, but suitably generalized to this much broader context of multiple different kinds of bosons and fermions. So the, just to re remind you, the creation operator is defined as follows. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to write, I'm going to write the unsymmetrized creation operator. And then we're going to symmetrize it. So I'm just going to mention by way of contrast, a bigger space that this one lives in that we've already seen, but we immediately dismissed. That's the bigger space, right? That's the one we started with. That's the one of n particles which are not identical. I just want to rem remind you that that space is behind here. Sometimes you might, I'm, I might call this Fox space as well. I might call this unsymmetrized Fox space or use some language like this. Turns out that's a, it's actually a rather interesting space all by itself. And uh, we'll get a glimpse of it as we write down the creation operators. But then I sadly won't follow up the details of that. So if you recall, H is always the single particle Hilbert space in this, this course. 
like two level system or I don't know a harmonic oscillator or something. And this unsymmetrized Fox space I'll call gamma of H. Now every one, every element of gamma S of H lives in a canonical way in gamma of H. It's just a subspace. And we're going to define, just repeating last week's lecture here, but without the S. So this notation probably needs some explaining. It occurred to me. So recall that if you've got some vector in gamma S of H or gamma of H for that matter, what is it? Well, it's a list of vectors, right? One for each subspace. Gamma S of H has an, is it, is a direct sum of an infinite number of subspaces. You just write this vector as a sum over all these subspaces. Where psi n is just the projection of that vector onto the subspace of n particles. Then, I'm oh, sorry. If psi is an element of Fox space, then it's a sum of terms which are projections of that state onto the n particle subspaces. So that's what this notation here means. It means find the projection onto the n particle subspace. you see the subscript n, it means just find the component on the subspace gamma s n of h. There we go. So let's just look at this definition of the creation operator for a moment and just think what it's doing. You've got some single particle state, little psi. And the action of the creation operator is simply to tensor on that little psi onto the n minus 1 component. So another way of writing A is to get rid of the n subscript and then just write out its action completely on a, on a, by extending by linearity. There it is. 
and this so we take some vector that's in the tensor product of h n minus one times we tensor on a vector then it's in a bigger Hilbert space right it's in h tensor n so that's all the that ADAG is doing it's just tensoring on that state psi So that's what A does on unsymmetrized Fox space. What A does on symmetrized Fox space, well, it's not defined on symmetrized Fox space. Think about taking a nice symmetric vector and tensoring on a different vector. The new thing is no longer symmetric under permutations. So this definition sort of fails, right? It's not the good definition for a creation operator because it takes things in the symmetric subspace out of the symmetric subspace, which is bad. And all we're going to do is we're going to correct for that failure by projecting back into the symmetric subspace. We're really doing the simplest possible thing. Now, one thing I want you to convince yourself of is that if you write this unsymmetrized uh, creation operator that you can get any vector you like in unsymmetrized Fox space. You know, I, uh, by the time I raise the board, I hope that the proof should be clear to you. Pick a vector in the unsymmetrized Fox space and imagine how you would get that by applying creation operators one after the other to the vacuum. So if you had the vector E1 tensor E2 tensor E3, in unsymmetrized Fox space, you would get it by first applying AE1, uh, AE3, AE2, AE1. And then there's a, a factor you have to worry about. So for example, if you've got this following state, E1, E2, E3, inside of H tensor 3, which is, of course, the subspace of our full unsymmetrized Fox space, then the way you would get that from the vacuum is you would first create a, a 3 particle. Yeah, that way, right? Then you would create an a E2 particle, a particle in the internal state E2, and then you would create, finally, an E1 state and then you've got some uh, annoying factors around. You've got a root 1, a root 2, and a root 3. So you've got to divide by and that gives us as required. So any other vector, you just think of any vector you like. You like. It's going to be a linear combination of product vectors like this, each of which you can get by applying creation operators to the vacuum. So you can generate the entirety of unsymmetrized Fox space with these vectors found by applying these creation operators. So you know, I hope this makes it completely evident and completely clear that these creation operators might be a good thing to think about. But as I said, they have this defect, right? A of some state phi applied to some other state in symmetrized Fox space is not an element of symmetrized Fox space because the way this operator acts is it just tenses the phi at the front and it doesn't there's no symmetry guaranteed when you tensor phi to the front of psi. So the way you fix that is the way we've did it, done throughout the entire of our discussions on Fox space. We just apply a projection to it, and then we're done.
And that gives us the definition we had at the end of the previous lecture. So this was a little digression intended to motivate better the definition of this operator from the unsymmetrized space perspective. So from the unsymmetrized perspective, it's pretty clear why this would be a thing you'd want to do. And it's, I hope I've made it uh, at least plausible that this definition doesn't work in the symmetrized Fox space case. nice thing about unsymmetrized Fox space is it gives rise to an algebra of creation and annihilation operators that's very fascinating. You won't have ever heard of it. So our digression gets longer. In unsymmetrized Fox space, these creation operators are proportional to objects which have a name. They're elements of a thing called the Kuntz algebra. So in the case where our single particle Hilbert space H is C N, then these creation operators are proportional to objects called O J star, where E J's are an orthonormal basis of H. So these OJs, are, are they generate an abstract algebra, which has many really peculiar properties. I uh, sadly won't have time to go into the details of this algebra, but it's very, it, it has a lot of really remarkable and curious properties in that it captures both the fermions and boson cases at the same time. So that's a little digression that I, I will resist. I will resist this digression. It would be fun to go down this path, but uh, nah. All right, let's go back to our creation and annihilation operators. I showed you this exchange relation in the last lecture. Now, um, let's talk about what happens when you apply these operators on the vacuum. May have mentioned this last week. I can't remember. Doesn't matter. Let's take a vacuum and mimic what we did just then in the unsymmetrized Fox space case. What's going to happen when we apply to the vacuum now symmetrized? Oops creation operators on the vacuum. Well, according to the definition, it's precisely proportional to this state here. But these vectors span all of 
Fox space. So we immediately deduce that this generates all the Fox space, just applying these creation operators to the back end. Now what we're going to do is introduce an adjoint to the creation operator. So, so far we've just got this operator that creates from the vacuum states. Well, it's an operator, it's an... And, you know, you're, you're allowed to ask the question, what is its adjoint? Is it Hermitian? Maybe it's a unitary operator. Actually, in the, the Kuntz algebra case, it turns out that these things are more like isometries than they are... Uh, and, uh, general operators. So the adjoint, you see I wrote these creation operators with a little dagger already. I mean I was anticipating in notation taking the adjoint to get rid of the dagger. So the adjoint's gonna be thought of as a kind of inverse. And the inverse to creation is a, well, destruction or annihilation. So we will call the adjoints the annihilation operators. And the task now is to describe these adjoint operators. Well, what do they do? And eventually, by the end of today, we will have an explicit description of both creation and annihilation operators, and we'll eventually drag it all the way back to something that should be quite familiar from your discussion of the harmonic oscillator. So at the moment, as written, I think the creation operators are things that you may not have seen before, at least in this form. I, hope, I guess it doesn't look very familiar. So I'm going to describe the adjoint AS of AS dagger in terms of its action on a symmetrized vector. sort of a bit more complicated than you might have thought. Okay. That formula is an exercise. It's kind of easier to describe this formula in words than it is to derive it. This, the adjoint 
AS phi of this creation operator, you get it by taking the inner product of phi with this state here. But of course, phi is an element of the single particle Hilbert space, and this state here is an element of the n-fold tensor product of the single particle Hilbert space. So the way you, you get around this is you take the inner product of this with each of these vectors in turn and sum them up. That's what this is doing here. Then you have to make sure you're still in the symmetric space, so you have to apply this P of X. And you've got some factor here, a minus sign, depending on if you're in the Fermi case or the Bose case. It's, it's not a, a particularly beautiful equation, but it's, it's what it is. And I will leave it up to you to confirm that's how it acts. And now we come to the we come now to the algebra that, that was foreshadowed by the title of this lecture. So these two operators they behave in a very special way. So this is an operator here. It's a product of the creation operator and its adjoint. So let these two vectors be elements of the single particle space. Construct this operator here. This is a, it's an operator, right? Call it, I don't know, M. Here's another one that you can construct. It's a bilinear in phi 1 and phi 2. It's called M prime. Now these two operators, they, the products of two annihilation of annihilation and a creation operator, they have a very special property, and that is that they don't change the total number of particles. These two operators are very special. They conserve the total number of particles. Thus, what do we learn about these two operators? Well, if you act them on any vector in the n-particle space, you've got, got to get back a vector in the n-particle space. what it means conserve total particle numbers So we're going to find some really remarkable result. When we act both of these operators on this vector here, we're going to find the same result, only different, differing by a sign. All right, there it is. This is the fundamental property about these creation and annihilation operators, which makes them so extremely useful for computations. The action of this operator, a dagger s phi 2 followed by a s 
phi 1 is exactly the same as AS phi 1 followed by AS dagger phi 2, except for a sine and a constant factor there. And what we do is we summarize all of this in a much shorter notation. summarize all that together in a so-called S bracket notation like this. other notations that you'll see people use. Sometimes you see people using this notation. And of course, I've written down here the connection between this S bracket notation and the standard commutator. So when S is plus one, then the S bracket is just the anti-commutator, which I usually write with the, uh, the curly brackets. And when S is minus one, we get the standard commutator like that. So what we've learned, we've learned something very valuable here about these creation and annihilation operators. They satisfy a relationship, an algebraic relationship between the ASs and their adjoints. And this, is, this, this, this relationship here allows us to specify very many things with a very uh, small amount of data. Very useful. And it also allows us to build interesting algebras out of these objects. But to be absolutely clear, in writing down these A's, we've chosen a distinguished basis of operators with respect to which we specify operators. Now, choosing bases is bad, right? You shouldn't do it. But you have to, to do computations. The way you usually convince yourself that choosing a basis is totally fine is you, you make the argument that this expressing everything with respect to basis B is just equivalent to specifying everything with respect to a different basis C. I just have to do a unitary transformation to get between the two. So it really doesn't matter if I've chosen a basis. And the way to think invariantly about something you've done with respect to a basis is you just form the vector space, you form the vector space spanned by that basis. And then that's an invariant concept. Now, in, when we have operators, we've chosen, at this point here, we've chosen a basis of operators, A's and A daggers. Every other operator we talk about now is going to be a linear combination of these operators or a product thereof. If we want to build an invariant concept with respect to these specific operators, what we have to do is generate an algebra of these operators. And that algebra has a name. And it's called the commuti canonical anti-commutations relation algebra when we have S is plus one, 
and the canonical commutations relation algebra when s is minus 1. I'm going to get into the little bit more the computational details now of these operators. Uh, let me just write this. So you'll often see people say the car algebra, canonical anti-commutation relations algebra. When s is minus 1, it's not so easy, unfortunately. In fact, it's really not so easy when s is minus 1. When we have bosons, there's a big difference between the annihilation and creation operators. There's a big difference with respect to the boson and the fermion case. And that is that if you take the norm of one of these ASs in the Fermi case, you have bounded operators. But in the boson case, the norm of these ASs is unbounded. These creation annihilation operators are not bounded operators, which is bad. Right? This is very, very awkward to deal with. So you might think that you just generate an algebra with these things, even though they're unbounded, but it, that creates some really severe technical problems. And so what we actually have to do is to generate a, the, a, a reasonable algebra of bounded operators in this boson case, we're going to have to take exponentials of these guys. So we'll do this later in the course, but I just write it now anyway. The S is minus 1 case is called the canonical commutation relation algebra, CCR. These are invariant concepts now. The algebra is, the entirety of the algebra is invariant. It doesn't, you haven't chosen a basis. Focusing on a computation involving some A's is choosing a basis. But of course, you're forced to by, usually by the demands of the problem set to you. Now, I'm going to introduce more and more notation now. The, t the task now is to connect this stuff in the, this notation that I've chosen here with lots of different notations that you'll see roundabout in textbooks and so on. So we'll spend the next, I guess, the rest of this lecture introducing notations and looking at some, excuse me, basic computations. Now the first thing to note is that usually we have a basis in mind for the box space.
All right, a bit of language here associated with this notation. <coughs> we drop the S straight away. It's almost always clear from the context what S is. If we're talking about bosons, S is plus one. If we're talking about fermions, S is minus one. So from now on, the, the distinction between the two ceases to be important because we'll just make it clear from the context. We call phi mu a mode function. That's one of the words we may use for these. Uh, a mode shape, an envelope. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of specifying the state of a single particle. And in the context of optics, we do that with respect to modes. So also in the case of vibrations, it's natural to talk of modes. Almost always these functions phi mu will be something like sines or cosines. Sometimes they'll be Hermite polynomials, but more or less, almost always, we'll be having Fourier bases. So that's why we talk about modes, envelopes. The operator that annihilates a fermion from mode mu, we just write that as a mu. The operator that creates a boson from mode mu in mode mu is just a dagger mu. So that notation helps so that we don't have to write these phi's in brackets all the time. So these little notation shifts are what makes this tolerable. It gets pretty tedious after a while to start writing out these expressions. But if you slowly build up these efficient notations and you can sort of tolerate the, the notational, the, the mess that comes. There's, it's worth noting that this map from an element of the single particle Hilbert space to the operator which annihilates a particle with mode psi, this map here, this is an anti-linear map. And because it's an anti-linear map, we can write it out in terms of the, our nice new basis as follows. So that's what allows us to express every possible annihilation operator as a linear combination of these operators a mu here. We just exploit the fact that as of mu, uh, as of phi, of psi, sorry. Yeah, psi, that's a psi here. As of psi is just a linear combination of these a mu's and the coefficients are none other than these coefficients there. Now the bracket relation, the algebraic relation between the annihilation and creation operators can be expressed in terms of this basis equivalently in a way that I hope starts to look extremely familiar. So in the boson case, the S is minus one case, we have these canonical commutation relations. The A's all commute with each other. The A daggers all commute with each other. But A mu and A nu, they don't commute when mu is nu. And in that case, they're exactly equal to the identity. Not bad, huh? 
that, and when we have only one mode that's relevant for us, a single mode, then we recover the harmonic oscillator algebra. So when the basis is one dimensional, we recover our familiar annihilation and creation operators from the harmonic oscillator solution. In the fermion case, it's exactly the same, except we've got to remember to put a plus sign instead of a minus sign everywhere. There we go. That should also be semi-familiar to you, depending on... how much solid state theory you've looked at so far. Another thing we can do is we can actually work out the matrix elements of all of these operators. There's an infinite amount of data there, but we can still specify it. There's a little program we can write that tells us what's the matrix element in the ij's position. Remember how we specified vectors in Fox space? We chose this occupation number basis where we said that this state has n1 particles in state E1, n2 particles in state E2, and so on. The action of this creation operator on such an occupation number state is exactly the following. So it takes the number of particles in mode mu and increases them by one. That's what this operator there does. Similarly for the annihilation operator. So that's enough to write these things on a computer. Yep. Question. Ah. Yeah. The question is, what's the meaning of the pi? Yeah. Right. That pi is not um, not yet determined. Sorry. I should have I should have written on. Yeah. The, the definition isn't complete. Sorry.
the permutation pi appearing here is the one, you know, so I should use a slightly different That's the notation I should have used. Sorry about this. The permutation pi appearing in the definition of the creation annihilation operators is the one which sorts the tuple mu comma mu one mu two into ascending order. Now for bosons it doesn't matter because s of pi is just one. But for fermions it matters and, and the reason it matters is that if you, maybe we'll do an example, I guess we do an example. Problem is if you create, yo. Oh, that's a mu plus one. Yeah, I probably, that's also very, yeah, good point. Yeah, that should be a mu plus one. Yeah, uh, beware my superscripts and subscripts here. This is not subscripted plus one. This is a subscripted plus one. Yeah, if you uh, create a fermion, you have to sort it into the right order. So maybe I'll do an example. So as I said, S is plus one, is, there's no difficulty there. Let's do H equals C to the three. Let's consider the state N one equals one n2 equals 0, n3 equals 1. So that's a uh, honest resident of the Fermi Fox space. And then let's create a fermion in the second mode on this state. Seems like a thing we should do. Now, what is it? Well, according to this recipe, we write out, it's kind of, it's going to be a bit boring, but it's worth doing anyway. Look at this. We've got to write this, this tuple out now. So mu, what is it? Well, it's two. Mu one, that's one, two, three, right? That's the, that's the, tuple that's relevant for this computation here. So we have to find the permutation that sorts these numbers into ascending order. And what it has to do is it has to flip two and one. So pi flips two and one. Wait on, there's a, because we don't have the two here, so it's just this. So we have to flip the two and the one. So pi, is the permutation which takes two, one, three, two, one, two, three, like that. Now that permutation is a transposition and S of pi is minus one. So we're almost done now. According to the definition that I just pushed down there, the answer is minus one times by root of n of mu plus one, so that's equal to zero, right? Which is n of two times one, one, one. So the action of a dagger on that state is 
minus one times by the boson action. There, so we capture the definition back on the board. And that's the computation you have to do for every single basis element. And that's what makes it tricky to put on a computer. It's extremely irritating to work out these minus one factors. But it's worth doing, let me tell you, it's worth finding out a matrix representation for these A's and A daggers, especially for the fermion case. So the, the boson case, you should have a pretty good, good feeling already what the A's and A daggers look like. They look like the ones for the harmonic oscillator. So they're infinite dimensional operators with square roots on the upper triangular entries and lower triangular entries, square roots of the integers. So it's not so ridiculous. But for fermions, these are really quite interesting objects when you write them out on the computer, you write out the matrix form, there's plus and minus ones all over the place. And in fact, there's a very interesting digression to make here. I think we have everything we need to do this. There's a, a formula for these, for these matrix elements here for the fermion case. So the formula for the matrix elements of the A's and the A daggers in the fermion case comes under, has a name, it's called the jordan Wigner transform. And is a very useful object indeed for actually working with these things. Because if you try and, and various people have various ways of working with creation and annihilation operators for fermions, but they're all pretty tedious computationally. So imagine trying to, if you, your single particle space was about 100, C is 100, and your job was to, to find the matrix representation for all 200 of these annihilation and creation operators. So that's a doable job. Maybe 100's too big, but that's your job. And you, you go off into Mathematica or MATLAB, whatever is your poison, and you start applying this formula. Then you write lots of inner loops to check, to find permutations and things like this. Yeah, you know, I, I, I claim it'll take you a non-trivial amount of programming effort to get your answer. Actually, 100 is, is a no-go, no. 100 is too big, but 10. The reason 100 is too, too bad is that the dimension of Fox space for 100 fermions is like 2 to the 100. So it's sufficiently horrible that you can't do it. But there is a, there's a kind of a closed form solution that you can exploit to, to find a representation of these, ob these objects. And it's called the jordan Wigner transform. And to define the jordan Wigner transform, we're going to need a couple of matrices. Called the Pauli matrices. There's the three Pauli operators there, three Pauli matrices. And we're going to work with N, C, N. So the Yeah, little n. So that means that yeah. we know the dimension of Fermi Fox space, it's C to the two to the dimension of the single particle space. 
We're going to build two other operators, sigma plus, which is, I always have to think this one through. It takes a vacuum to the plus zero, zero, one, zero. And sigma minus. So we have five two by two matrices. And the claim is really a remarkable fact. Using these five two by two matrices, we can construct matrix representatives for all of these A's. This is super cool. You know, when I first learned about Fermi anti-commutation relations, I went and programmed it and I found the matrix elements and I had some unbelievably slow n to the five multiple inner loops horrible, disgusting program to work out the matrix elements. I mean, it worked, it just took a very long time. But then when you learn about the jordan Wigner transformation, you, s you just don't need this anymore. You can just straight away write out the, the representation. The way we represent these fermions, these Fermi creation and annihilation operators, is we take tensor products of Pauli operators. This is the first one. A1 dagger is sigma 1 plus dagger, tensor I2, tensor I3. What's I? I is just the 2 by 2 identity. So I lied, there's six matrices that we need. And in fact, well, arguably we don't need Y, but that's... Well, A1 is the adjoint of A1 dagger, so we've got that one for free already. It's very convenient to use the notation I2 dot 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 n, just means do the identity. So that's great. I think you can check that they obey the right canonical anti-commutation relations. Now for the magic. When we build A2 dagger, we need this guy to anti-commute with A1 dagger. It's not good enough to just write down a sigma plus in the second place here because this matrix, whatever we write here, has to anti-commute with that. And there's a ready way to do it. Sigma 1 Z anti-commutes with sigma 1 plus. Very useful fact. And of course, just take the dagger of this. I hope you can see where this is going to go. So just, you know, there's a little exercise here. Do, do, do it. check that sigma z, sigma plus minus, anti-commutes with sigma z. Uh, w w sigma z anti-commutes with sigma plus minus. That's the exercise. Vital, right? This, it, without this property, it doesn't work. But I can already tell you how it works, this proof of this property. Just express sigma plus as a linear combination of y and z's. y's and z's anti-commute with sigma, uh, y's and x's anti-commute with sigma z. So they both anti-commute and it's done. That's A2. Let's now write out the general case. We need that this guy anti-commutes with all the previous guys. And we know how to do that, just put a string of sigma z's. And then we know how to make this behave like a fermion creation operator. Just put a plus there. And then for the remainder, put the identity. Done. 
Done. That's it. That's the formula. That's a way to get a, an honest matrix representation for these A's and A daggers. Just about any computer linear algebra program you have will, will allow you to do these tensor products. You can, with a finite amount of data, specify these six matrices here, of which you really only need sort of three or four, depending on how you count. And then these are matrices which do everything that the, they obey exactly the canonical anti-commutation anti relations. That's a little exercise for you. But as I was constructing it, I explained the, the, the argument there. Now, I think it's a supremely interesting question. Can you get away with smaller than 2 to the n? On one level, no. If you want to do it exactly, you're stuck with 2 to the n. But what if you want to only be approximately correct? So I'll leave that as a dangling question. challenge research question for you. I think this problem is still open. I know there's been recent progress on it. What if you only approximately want matrices which obey the canonical anti-commutation relations? You know, what if you're willing to have a mistake, an error? Can we get, find matrices that are smaller than two to the n by two to the n that obey this algebra? I think that's an intriguing question because it's, you know, you can see that when n is 10, you already got some pretty big matrices here. And when n is 100, then, well, you haven't got much hope. So if you could find a way to approximately represent this anti-commutations relation algebra with smaller matrices, that would have practical benefits. However, I seem to recall that there are some negative results in this direction. So I, I, although I can't remember where I saw that. say uh, I'll make one more comment and then yeah I think we'll stop so just one small comment about annihilation and creation operators and that is defining number operators okay, there's a, a special bilinear operator you can form. It has a, a name and it's very useful throughout physics. So let 
mu be a basis element, then we have a thing called the number operator. And why is it called the number operator? Well, I'll put a little hat there to indicate that it's an operator, not a number. If you act the number operator on an occupation number basis state, then befitting its name, it just pulls down the number of the, the number of particles in the muth mode. And we have one final thing. Remember how I defined this n hat operator, the total particle number operator? This, we will prove it in the next lecture or the one after, can be found by summing up the number operators for each of the boats. So that's a, uh, well, a taste of things to come. All right, I think that's all I wanted to cover today. So I thank you very much for your attention.